three Satanists, one Hindu, one Muslim, and one Christian pastor all have a discussion about their beliefs and faith. This is going to be interesting. I respond and react. Let's go. Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Isaac David and this is The Daily Disciple. If you don't know, if you're new to this channel, you don't know what's going on. Um, this is where I help you follow Jesus daily on this channel. So subscribe, subscribe, <laughs> subscribe because I'm making new videos all the time. Every single week on Thursday, so stay tuned for more videos and especially part two of this video. Anyway, we're going to get into the video first. I just want to give a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Um, you guys are amazing. Patreon is what basically keeps this ministry going and growing. Um, it's my biggest source of just support. So thank you so much for you guys who are on Patreon giving monthly. If you want to head on over to patreon.com slash daily underscore disciple and give a pledge, monthly pledge, that would be amazing. It is my goal to be able to do this full time and you would help me do that now. Onto the video. So for a little bit of backstory, I don't really know a whole lot about Satanism. I watched um, Living Waters had a series called Way of the Master. Uh, it was a television program where they did a bunch of different programs on different world religions. I actually interviewed a bunch of people. There was one on Satanism and I remember it being something like very similar to just humanism. So it's not that they're worshiping Satan, um, but it's kind of this idea of Satan giving knowledge to Adam and Eve. So that's why they see Satan as this kind of figure of knowledge and truth seeking and maybe skepticism. So um, that's just a little bit of a preface, but let's go in. Let's see what's going on. This I'm sure this is going to be interesting. You're not going to want to miss this. When I think of Abrahamic faith, I think of slaughterings and burnings and mutilations all in the name of God. So I just want you to notice that he's already making judgments against God. He's using his own subjective moral uh, moral standard to make objections about God for for his apparent crimes or any kind of Abrahamic religion that's that's doing something wrong. And so I just want you to be asking yourself this one question as we go out through today. When anybody that is not a Christian is saying something is wrong or it's mean or it's or it's evil, I want you to be asking yourself this question, by what standard? By what standard are they appealing to? Because what I have a feeling is a lot of these Satanists are going to continue to appeal back to their own sense of good and evil as opposed to something objective steady unchanging and so we got to look at the foundations of their reason of their morality um, because that's really the basis of their worldview and ultimately that's where their worldview crumbles hell is a real place i don't actually know like when I try to think of what hell looks like to me, I don't think it's how it's been in movies or people just talk about like a, some fiery inferno. I believe in an afterlife where there is a kind of a good place and a bad place where what you do here kind of determines where you're going to end up. Yeah. One of, one of the signs that there is something greater than us out there is that we see something beautiful that we want someone to express our thanksgiving to and our worship towards. And in the same way, on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, when there are terrible deeds or acts that are committed by humans towards one another, that there also needs to be a place of, of justice. And so, I, yeah, I believe that there is a heaven and that there is a hell and that the gift of grace that God offers us is so generous that, that for those who reject it, that there has to be a place of judgment. So, yeah. So is hell a real place? Here in Mark uh, 9, 43, it says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. See, the Bible is really clear about the fact that there is a hell. And I agree with this pastor when he's talking about the fact that we all understand whether that, you know, this is kind of an innate thing um, wired into maybe part of our conscience where we know, look, evil must be um, done away with in some just way. We know we're, we're reaching for the sense of justice. We know uh, based on our moral you know, conscience, God's law laid upon our heart, we know there needs to be a punishment for evil. Um, and so the, the, the idea of hell actually isn't that crazy of an idea because we all have this, this sense because we're made in the image of God that there needs to be 
justice. So the law of God was actually fulfilled in Jesus for those who believe in him. So we are held under the law of God, right? We're held to this standard. We can't meet this standard. But because of Jesus dying on the cross, when we trust in him, he is our substitute. He has fulfilled the law in and of, of himself. And because of that, he's taken the penalty for our sin on himself. And we can trust him for eternal life and actually uh, a, to be reborn, born again in his spirit. Personally, I would never worship a god they would send someone to an eternal lake of fire to be burned forever for the simple fact of non-belief. When that deity knows what it would take to convince every single person on this planet, that is cruel, it is inhumane, it is not kind, it is not generous, and that is not a god worthy of worship. Okay, once again, the Satanist here, this fellow, um, he's very, you know, he's dressed up in his very nice, interesting attire, almost cosplaying a Satanist in some way, I guess you could say. Um, but but he fits, he fits this kind of, this stereotype of a, of a Satanist, the twisty mustache. And once again, like I pointed out at the beginning, he is appealing to his own sense of morality. So he's appealing to the standard of morality, saying, hey, God is mean, God is just, like, not just, that's not nice, that's that's evil. Once again, where is he finding his sense of morality from? Because based on what I'm seeing, um, it's all just coming from himself. And when you begin to abandon the Bible, the ultimate um, truth, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and life, you're left with just uh, this changing, maybe based on culture or based on how you're feeling that day. Um, it's it's honestly sad. It's honestly sad because there are, uh, there is a standard. There is God's law that we can look to and we can look to his character too, to see what is good and right and wrong. And we are no, we are in no position to start accusing God of being evil when we ourselves have no foundation to stand on without him. What's more, it would be damning all, I mean, the vast majority of everyone who's ever existed for not believing in him for a set of rules that he created. So the Satanist rightly points out that, hey, look, wouldn't most people be going to hell if this is all true? And in Matthew 7, 13, it actually points that out. Yeah, it says, wide is the road to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life. And, and, and so, yeah, it's kind of a, it, for me, and I think for every kind of Christian and person that begins to realize this truth, it is a wake up call because it says, hey, look, if most people are going to hell and we are called to be laborers to to go out there and reap the harvest um this is a great and, and amazing task but it's an also an urgent task to share the gospel the great commission um because yeah people are perishing and and wide is the gate wide is the road that leads to destruction we ought to be warning people and say yeah this is true but there is hope in Jesus. There is a way to eternal life. And it's not based on just trying to be a morally upright person or a woke person. It's about trusting in Jesus and, and seeing his truth and, and his moral foundation impact the way that we live our lives now. Now we have a foundation to stand on instead of just our own subjective opinion. Oh, I think this is right. Oh, I think this is wrong. Oh, that seems evil. We have God's foundation, which is the ultimate true foundation to live our lives. I believe that in the event that we have spirits and they will go on to some other realm, it's probably more of a nebulous place than a physical hell, lake, fire, everything. I don't even believe we have souls necessarily. Yeah. Oh. I'd like to see some evidence like, before I, I, I believe something like believe that. I barely believe that we're even conscious, let alone. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm about to have an existential crisis up here. <laughs> when I was watching this video, it kind of caught me off guard because, um, like he sh say she's saying in kind of a funny way, um, but like she's having an existential crisis um, in terms of are we really real? And these are questions that, yeah, maybe you've asked yourself too. Are we really real? And I think this is a kind of a, 
a common, maybe a, an analogy or just an example of what happens when we abandon the truth of God. When we go on our own way, when we try to find out, hey, what, how, if without God, how do we know what we know? And how do we know that our reasoning is is, is real? And how do we know if we're, we're, we're even living right now? And all these kind of existential questions pile up on one another. I recently watched The Matrix and it kind of consists of this idea that we are all in a simulation. Elon Musk. Musk, um, famous entrepreneur, um, uh, you know, founder of Tesla and SpaceX, and I'll, I watched a documentary on him, but he believes that we're in a simulation. Without God, without the God's standard, without God's truth, which is the, the only truth is God's truth, without that, then we're just subject to kind of almost in this meaningless trying to find out what life is about. Are we really real? Or, or we're asking these questions. But God says, yeah, we are really real and we're created in his image. We're here to glorify God. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But there is answers available. And my heart goes out to these people that are having these existential, you know, crises because, because they're asking these questions and they're not looking to the source that has the answers. The historical Christian position is, is that, that the gift of the, the invitation that God gives to the people that he made is so, so generous and came at such a high price to a him. A high price, he gave that, up a um, weekend. That uh, He gave up a weekend. Right. He took a weekend. This to me just highlights a little bit of the uh, the, a little bit of the what, what 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 should I say ignorance ignorance of the Satanists because if you look in the scripture at all Isaiah fifty three three uh, highlighting the pain suffering agony that Jesus went through this was not um, God coming up and not experiencing any pain it wasn't just God just going through life because he's God and just doing his you know he was fully God and fully man and I think that's being underestimated here. He experienced pain, he experienced hurt, he experienced tremendous suffering for our sake. He was God before. Yeah, yeah. He was God during, and he's God now. He gave up a weekend. If I knew right now that I could go off and die, and then not die, how, where's the gift in that, number one? I'm able to look at, at the, the grace that has been extended to grace. me, and, I, and yeah. And I receive it. I want to make sure I can get a full yes. set of shots. Okay. So the way that I would commonly think of it is, is that if I gave up the life of, of my own son uh, in exchange for your life, that, that it is okay then for me to, to make the, the invitation that, that God makes towards us. Um, is that moral? Is it moral? Is it moral? On when a corporeal level. Jesus took on the, the penalty that I deserved for the, the sins that I committed, if, if we're looking at you know, the traditional Christian faith. And so I receive uh, his gift of grace and as, as a payment for, for the things that I had done. So your question, is it moral or is it just, is it fair? I'm able as a Christian to say, no, it's not fair. Um, because I deserve the, the punishment that he took on himself. Yeah, he asked, okay, is that moral? Is it moral? Well, it, it is just, Jesus fulfilled the law um, in order to save us. And that was the ultimate fulfillment of justice. And by his stripes, we are justified in him. So now we are no longer called guilty. To be justified means to be made right with. And by Jesus, we were made right with God. So is that moral? Well, it is just. And you know what also is just is us spending eternity in a lake of fire without Jesus because that is justice being fulfilled. You are either, justice either fulfilled in your punishment or in your salvation. And that's a tough truth, but we have to be holding on to that because that is that is the gospel. That that is the truth of and the reality of our world. I believe there is a higher purpose in life. I mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I strongly believe there's a higher purpose in life. I don't think I've found it yet, and I hope, and I'm, I would like to believe that I will one day in the journey of my life. I completely agree. I don't, I don't know what my purpose is, and I don't think it's, there's like a higher purpose that fits for everybody. But to me, the, no, the idea that there's some bigger purpose has always been very comforting to me. Otherwise, kind of what's the point of all of this? No, I fully agree. I think that... I believe it's a question that we all ask, and it's one of the gifts of faith, in, in, my, in my opinion. So that when there's times of, of epidemic and war... Um, pandemic. 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 <laughs> You're right. That's a better... Uh, Worldwide. Pandemic. <laughs> that, that we're able to 
understand, even in those situations of difficulty and conflict and, and anxiety and fear, that there is a higher purpose in life and that, that uh, there's more than, than what we see. Is there a higher purpose? Now, this is interesting to me because, I, I mean, I, I kind of understand where these, you know, these Satanists are coming from. From a humanistic perspective, if we're all, quote unquote, stardust, if we have no true creator, um, we're just kind of chemical reactions, no better than animals, is there an ultimate purpose for us? Well, preachers and the chemical reactions born out of random chance really have no higher purpose. So I understand why they're not you know, they're standing back. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson said in an interview in talking about meaning and purpose, he was really just saying, you know what, you create your own meaning and purpose. There is no higher or ultimate purpose. You find that where you want to. For the Hindu and Muslim, they're saying, hey, there is a higher purpose, but it's something you discover. And I kind of understand this, but they may be conflating two things. As a Christian, I would say we have an ultimate purpose. The Westminster Confession of Faith talks about the fact that we, our purpose as humans is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our ultimate purpose. Now we may think we, we sometimes talk about our purpose on this earth. So whether you're working for an organization, you're like, this is my purpose. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and I understand, Hey, that kind of purpose. Yeah. You do discover that and you, 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 at different points in your life, you have different purposes, um, small P purposes, but ultimate purpose doesn't change. We're here to glorify God. We're not just here to discover what our small P purpose is, but it's to step into our ultimate purpose. And we can do that through lots of different purposes we have through our, our life. I, life. I hope that makes sense. Um, Christianity is not just this thing where you're trying to figure out what we're supposed to be doing ultimately. Ultimately, our purpose is to glorify God. And now your job is just to look in the Bible, look at your opportunities and say, how can I do that today? I trouble with the phraseology higher purpose because that, again, that denotes, do I believe God? No, but I do believe higher purpose as in love, to give, to be generous, to be kind, to help, to heal, to be there to understand. This is interesting to me, and I think you'll see this 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 play out with a lot of people, not just Satanists. And and maybe maybe one of our lessons in this particular video could be Satanists aren't that like you know devil worshiping, hey, da, 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 and chanting all this kind of thing, but they are actually very similar to the average person on the street. This fellow's God sounds to be love, you know, in his in his definition of love. He he says, you know, I, I my purpose is to is to love to be kind, to, you know, to help people to listen. Um, those are things based on his own standard of, of good and right and wrong. It, those are things in, in, in love as well. He is building his foundation, his, his worldview off of the, his own definition of those things. And those things have become his God. And where do those things come from? Well, they come from him. So he has become his own God. And that is kind of the basis of humanism is that as, as a humanist, you are focused on the value that humans place on each other and the things that, and as humanists, really humans are at the center. Um, and, and, and for some, it may be kind of a nihilistic perspective, like, look, there really is no higher purpose. Humans may be at the center as if we're, because we're the most evolved life forms, but ultimately, you know, it doesn't matter. And I think, you know, um, a lot of people make love their God, but we need to be pointing them to who defines love. And ultimately that is God who truly defines what true love is. Well, this has been a ride, but I want to let you know that there's going to be a part two next week. Let's go because th this video that, that we're reacting to is so long. Uh, we got to do a part two and believe me, it gets even more interesting in part two. So you're going to want to subscribe so you can watch that. Thank you so much for watching guys. Um, I hope this was helpful for you in your kind of walk and, and whatever you're going through, whether you're a Christian or whether you're just kind of looking into it. I hope this helped you in some way and give it a like down below if you enjoyed this video. I hope you guys are enjoying these kind of reaction videos. Um, I'm having a lot, a lot of fun doing them and, uh, and yeah, anyway, follow me on Instagram. If you haven't already at, um, it's Isaac David. That's my, <laughs> you can follow me on TikTok too. Um, 
at It's Isaac David too. Look at me. And you know what else we got going on? I have a new YouTube channel. It's true. I'm going to play you a little clip from it now. And so I want to show you around my studio because I think it could be kind of interesting for you. I've been working on it for two years and um, it's kind of a cool place. So let's get into it. So I'm going to leave the link to my YouTube channel, my new YouTube channel, in the link in the description here. I encourage you to subscribe. At least check out some of the content because it's kind of all, you know, random stuff. So you might find something you like. Um, thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time. God bless.